So many people are looking to live happier, more stress-free lives. We provide interviews from mental health experts across various fields because we know finding quality information isn't always easy. Let's find more sanity together. On today's episode, Dr. Catherine Donovanville talks on cognitive processing therapy and PTSD. Dr. Donovanville is a clinical psychologist and is board certified in cognitive and behavioral psychology. She's an associate professor in the Division of Behavioral Medicine and the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. She's also the director of research for the Fort Hood site of the Strong Star Consortium, the largest center for clinical trials in the Department of Defense targeting PTSD and related conditions, and the Consortium to Alleviate PTSD, where she oversees staff in treating thousands of service members and collaborates with some of the world's leading experts. She is also the program director for the Strong Star Training Initiative, which trains providers and organizations that service military and veteran communities in evidence-based treatment. Beyond this, she's a trainer and consultant in cognitive processing therapy for PTSD and has trained hundreds of mental health providers and consulted organizations to implement this treatment in community settings. In 2016, she was awarded the University of Texas Health Science Center Presidential Award for Clinical Service, and in 2017, she was awarded the Arthur W. Melton Early Achievement Award from the Society of Military Psychology of the American Psychological Association. Now on to the interview. Hi, Katie. Thanks so much for coming on Saturday Podcast. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Um, so to start off the show, I'd like to ask everybody uh, what type of therapist they are and what their approach to treatment looks like. So I'm going to start off there. Okay, so I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist. I'm more of a big C, so a cognitive therapist, and I specialize in uh, PTSD, treatment for PTSD, specifically cognitive processing therapy. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean to be a big C or more on the cognitive side of CBT? What does that look like? Yeah, so what that means is is that um, in cognitive therapy, we're looking at the way people are thinking about things in the world and what they're telling themselves about that and looking at whether those thoughts are realistic or whether those thoughts are helpful. And so we're really focusing on thoughts rather than behaviors. Okay. And then what is the hope that, so you focus on these thoughts and then what are you trying mm -hmm. to do with these thoughts and what do you hope it's going to do when you work with them? Yeah. So by looking at some of the thoughts that people are having and teaching them some skills to evaluate those thoughts, clients are able to uh, change the way that they're thinking if that thinking is not helpful or if that thinking is not realistic, depending on what their goals are and the way they want to live their life. Okay. And then is the hope that um, with the change in thinking that that how important is the behavioral change from the change in thinking in your model? Yeah. So when people change their thinking about things, then they start acting different, acting in a way that is in closer to what's important to them. So if someone tells themselves that nowhere's safe and then they realize, hey, wait a minute, there are safer places and there are precautions I can take to make myself feel safer or be safer, then they start to go out in the world in a way that's more functional that's more in line with things they want to do. Hmm. And you mentioned that you specialize in cognitive processing therapy, which is a therapy for uh, PTSD and trauma. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and to get started, just uh, briefly, can we, can you just tell the audience what is, what is PTSD? So PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder. So it's one of the only disorders that someone has to experience something in order to develop it. So people have to experience what's called a trauma. And unfortunately, most people in their lifetime will experience at least one trauma in their life. After the trauma, what happens, what we know is almost everybody has symptoms of PTSD. PTSD. 
immediately after experiencing that trauma. But over time, most people recover from those symptoms. So those symptoms naturally come down. Those symptoms could be things like nightmares, um, physiological arousal. So let's say you were in a, a car accident um, where you thought you almost died or you could have died or maybe even severely injured, that it would be normal and natural to have symptoms like feeling anxiety around getting in a car, maybe even having a nightmare about that accident. Maybe you, you, you don't want to drive anymore. Maybe you start to have feelings like um, anger or maybe even guilt or shame related to the circumstances of the car accident, not sleeping well. Over time, for most people, those symptoms start to come down, usually in that um, weeks, if not by three month mark. But for other people, for and especially if a trauma is severe enough, those symptoms may persist longer term and people will then be diagnosed with with PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah, I think the car accident is a great example because when I was, geez, uh, probably around 12, we got, my mother was driving, got ran off the road and the very mm -hmm. thing they described, I was scared to get in the car with her. I was scared to get in other cars, particularly for her to drive. I would have nightmares mm -hmm. about it. And after a couple of weeks, you know, especially with, because my mom had to drive me places, um, mm -hmm. it, it went away, but, but absolutely. Um, is there any other uh, factors besides how bad the trauma is that explains why some people have more of this ac acute reaction versus having a more chronic reaction? Yeah. So when we look at trauma exposure across the population in a lifetime, we see that there are different types of trauma that are more likely to lead to PTSD symptoms. Hmm. So, it can, it, it, traumas like, for example, um, community disasters like hurricanes, tornadoes, these are experienced on the community level and community gets around each other. They talk about it. They feel their feelings. There's nothing shameful related to whether your house got hit by the tornado and someone else's. That doesn't have to do with who you are as a person. It's just the, the path of the tornado. And so we see among those types of traumas, lower rates of PTSD. Now, Katrina was different in that many people lost their community. So they moved out of New Orleans into these new communities. And so they lost a lot of that support and um, the experience of it being um, related to kind of everybody around me. Um, when we kind of look at other types of traumas, like things like sexual assaults and uh, the various different types of traumas that happen in a combat zone, we see higher rates of PTSD. Um, when we look at our first responders, we see higher rates of PTSD related to trauma exposure where um, they're coming on a scene and uh, maybe a kiddo is killed or they're responding to an incident with, with a child. And so, we see kind of a, a broad range. Most people have experienced many traumas in their life um, and recover from many of them, but some of them, they may be experiencing PTSD related to. Hmm. Um, and and I, that's actually um, an interesting topic point. I mean, the, the research, they're looking into the idea of multiple traumas over time and the impact of that mm -hmm. rather than just one big trauma, maybe like in childhood, there, there's a repeat trauma offense. Mm -hmm. um, it, where's the, do you know where the status is on that of where they're looking at like, like, um, like traumas over time or of longitudinal repeat, repeated traumas? Yeah, you know, I think when we look at any of the research on PTSD treatment and we look at the people who are in those studies, um, it is rare to see someone with just one trauma. Hmm. Um, and so I think one way to think about it is, is people are generally resilient when they experience trauma. So generally what happens after you experience a trauma is you have some initial distress and over time, those symptoms start to come down. People even grow from traumas and learn um, and have, you know, we, we've got the term post-traumatic growth. Um, but, but generally, there's, there's one or two. When someone goes to, on to develop BT, PTSD, it's usually one or two that are, are driving those symptoms, specifically symptoms like nightmares, um, the re-experiencing, like intrusions. Um, the other thing that you often hear is that when you take a, um, a history of your client is that 
people developed PTSD maybe from something early on. Maybe that was childhood sexual abuse. Maybe that was a rape. Maybe that was their first deployment. And then they go on to experience trauma after trauma after trauma. And so we often see, especially in individual domestic violence survivors, that they have you, you multiple relationships where that domestic violence mm. has happened. But when you go back to what's driving the symptoms, it's usually something early on. And it's the PTSD that uh, makes them more vulnerable to experience future trauma. Okay. And, um, yeah. And, and I think I remember reading that, um, that if you have one traumatic event, there's that increased risk for future trauma. And is that where it comes from or is it, or is it more complicated than that? I mean, I think it depends, right? So if we think about service members is that you would expect anyone who's deployed to a combat zone to experience exposure to trauma. Mm -hmm. And so another deployment means more exposure to trauma. Absolutely. Um, we also know in our service member veterans that they, um, many of them have had adverse childhood experiences, um, which may or may not has led to PTSD. So some of the theory is a little bit more of a, like, is there, is it a blister or a callus, right? So maybe when I experience lots of traumas adver or maybe adverse childhood experience that somehow kind of bolsters my resilience um, to go on to experience more more traumas or more life, right? Which in turn is trauma, it will lead to trauma exposure the longer that we live. But the rates of PTSD among our service members and veterans, they, they vary widely, but we're looking at somewhere between, you know, high teens and 25%. If you look at how many people have deployed, we have more people who've had extreme trauma exposure that don't have PTSD, the majority, than those that do. And so it's not just trauma exposure or cumulative trauma exposure that, that leads to PTSD. It's usually, and kind of when, when we work on the folks that come in with PTSD, um, it's usually the weird events, the things you couldn't prepare for um, that that don't make a lot of sense. So among service member veterans, it's things like they were supposed to go on a mission and they got pulled back and then something bad happened. And they tell themselves, if I was there, I could have prevented it hmm. or they switch seats or um, something that, that just can't doesn't make sense um, that that people get stuck in the symptoms of PTSD and trying to make make sense of it. Yeah. And so, so that's a, a one, of uh, um, definitely sounds like a cognitive factor there that, that makes it mm -hmm. so it's a it go more chronic rather than acute. And is mm -hmm. there, um, besides going through trauma events, is there any biological things or any other predispositions that people might have as the why person, one person would develop PTSD versus another? Yeah. I mean, there, there, there's, um, a lot of looking at different biomarkers and I think as it relates to any of our, um, our disorders that it's there's a biological cycle psychological and social in in the ptsd world it is so much more social right the experience of trauma than it is biological we do see um that that children adult and adult children of trauma survivors to be more at risk for the development of ptsd and i think you know it's interesting because i yeah. What I hear a lot is, is, is clients with PTSD who experienced childhood trauma, their parents also likely had trauma exposure and PTSD and therefore weren't able to be the best parents that we needed to them to be in order to prevent this exposure. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that exposure is even by the people who, tr who, who abused the parents. And, and so there's there's um, lots of different social systems that are kind of leading to that. Um, but I, I'm not an expert in the biologics. Um, it's not like um, something like schizophrenia or autism or bipolar, where there's this strong biologics that is driving. And that's actually good because it means treatment um, uh, is quite successful for PTSD and people recover um, and they 
uh, they stay better because there's not a lot of strong biology that is maintaining these symptoms as a, a, in a chronic way once people get treated. Yeah. And before, and we're going to jump to the treatment here in, in a second. Um, you know, one thing that we're talking about is not everybody that goes through trauma and has a mental health um, issue stemming from it is PTSD. And sometimes people mm -hmm. say, I have PTSD from this, or people get misdiagnosed. What are some other uh, reactions that people have from trauma, mental health wise, that is not PTSD? Yeah. So, one really important one is growth. People experience something traumatic, and that experience then they learn from it. They may, that may send them on a trajectory where somebody maybe chooses to go in a profession, dedicates mm. their life to something. Um, but to be, to, to grow from it, um, not that that trauma, I mean, the trauma is a bad memory. It's something bad that happened to them. We can't remove that from somebody's brain, but, but many people, um, uh, that, uh, defines kind of where they go in life um, in, in a potentially really positive way. Um, another reaction that people have from trauma might be different mood symptoms, things like sadness, depression, um, maybe just kind of general anxiety. Maybe they were someone who was like a warrior and now they worry a lot more. And so it kicked up more of a general kind of anything could happen. I have mm -hmm. no control but, but not a PTSD symptoms reaction. Um, you know, I think another thing that's really important um, is related to moral injury. And so sometimes traumas um, are experienced, whether it's something that I did or didn't do, or someone did or didn't do that, that clashes with my values and my morals. And so moral injury is a term that's gotten a lot of important attention and it may include part of that might be PTSD and part of it might be uh, is something else that requires us to really kind of support clients or for individuals to really um, also examine their values, their morals, maybe in their relationship with their faith leader or community um, as it relates to making sense of this thing that happened that I may or may not may or may not have to anything to do with my behaviors, maybe have to do with somebody else's behaviors, but maybe I behaved in a way I don't feel super proud of. And I have to think about making sense of that and explore concepts like forgiveness, self-forgiveness, um, and, and those types of meaning. Mm. Um, but ultimately it sounds like one common thread here and correct me if I'm wrong, is that there is, um, potential for change in someone's pers perspective of the world, their, their worldview, it, or, I mean, it could be self world, others future, but whether it's PTS, PTSD or not, and it could be a positive shift potentially, but mm -hmm. also it could be a negative shift, which could increase anxiety and depression in ways that is not actually, you know, a PTSD response. Exactly. Um, as after the trauma is over, people are trying to make sense about why did this this thing happen? Um, and so as they're making sense of it, you know, there are lots of ways in which their brain can grow or get stuck. Hmm. Um, so before we jump into treatment, is there any last last things about a trauma or PTSD that, that you think is important for people to know? I think that most people who experience traumas often are wondering what is it about me that is causing this bad reaction or what was it about me that made this happen? And I think it's just important to know that it has nothing to do with you. Um, that it's likely that, that you were the opportunity if it was interpersonal trauma and not the reason. And that um, the fact that you're having these symptoms or reactions means you're human, not that you're there's anything about you. It just means you're human. These are human reactions to making sense of something as abnormal as a trauma. Hmm. Um, and is there any... Um is the longer it takes for people to go into treatment a, a factor on, on symptom severity or likelihood of, of recovering from treatment? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, unfortunately, it generally takes people, no matter what behavioral health disorder, about a decade to find someone like you or I or another mental health provider. So the it's not uncommon. It takes people a while to get into treatment. Mm 
What we know from treatment for PTSD is it doesn't matter how long it's been, whether it's, you know, three months or 40 years that people can get better and they can recover. What is better about getting into treatment earlier is that the symptoms of PTSD and often some of the comorbidities, the way in which people cope with PTSD and try to avoid those symptoms, that they can start to disrupt life in a pretty significant way. And so the longer that it takes to get into treatment, the more disruption. And, and that's something that we may not be able to, to change, hmm. um, but recovery is possible um, regardless of how long it's been. Okay. Um, so your, your uh, expertise is cognitive processing therapy, but there's two other main uh, forms of treatment. Mm -hmm. So I hope that you could sort of briefly cover what those are. Uh, and so we have prolonged exposure and EMDR. Um, yeah. So, so in the PTSD approaches to treatment, the great news is we have three very effective treatments. And to date, if we looked at the research, we would probably say that all three of these are just as easily effective. Um, we don't at this point in the research, I can't say that if you had this trauma, try this therapy, or if you have brown eyes, do this therapy. We don't have personalized medicine in that way. And we may, may, we may never, but, but we're, we're working on that in research. But the good news is, is we've got three different options that are really great, effective treatments for PTSD. So prolonged exposure is a behavioral treatment. And so that is a treatment where you, as a client, are identifying the things that you're avoiding and you're systematically with your, with your therapist approaching those things. And over time, your body starts to uh, recalibrate that alarm system and realize that, like you said, getting in the car with your mom in the community you lived in, you had to do that. And so over time, you, the anxiety response started to get easier and easier. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that happens in prolonged exposure is you go, you talk about the trauma over and over again. And so when people have PTSD, usually what happens is their brain gets stuck in this IMAX version of their trauma, of the worst parts. And by talking about it over and over again, eventually it just becomes like this black and white version where it's no longer um, getting this big emotional reactions and you're able to file that away in your brain. Um, so that's a really great treatment option. EMDR is another treatment option, um, and this this treatment option is um, a little different in that um, it's called eye movement desensitization EMDR reprocessing, in which what is happening is that the therapist is is facilitating the processing of the memory by moving the eyes back and forth as the patient is thinking about the trauma. Um, and so that's an, another therapy that um, has been shown to be effective in the treatment of PTSD. Um, and then cognitive processing therapy is more of a top-down thinking therapy. Um, and so these are three good options. Um, if you are somebody that experienced PTSD or you're somebody who wants to specialize in PTSD to get trained in, um, um, and do, do we expect the same um, changes or results from all three treatments? Like when they look at the research, are they looking at the same symptoms or is there certain changes yeah. that you'd expect from one or another because of the different angles that is coming through? Yeah, good question. So in all of the research, they are really studying reduction in PTSD symptoms. So those are the nightmares, the avoidance, the difficulty sleeping, the, the negative thoughts about yourself and others. And so in all three of these therapies, we would expect that the PTSD symptoms would come down. The other thing that we find is when PTSD improves, depression improves. And so with PTSD, depression is a common comorbid symptom that improves. Um, we also have seen um, in the research with PE and CPT, and I'm not as familiar with EMDR, is reductions in suicidal thoughts. Is as people start to feel better, they, they stop having these thoughts about not wanting to, to live or wanting to kill themselves.
All right, so let's jump into CPT. That's your jam. That's what you specialize yeah. in. Um, and uh, was was there a reason why why you chose to go uh, to go that route, like to to focus on CPT? Yeah, so I'm trained in CPT and PE, mm. um, but I just find that I'm more of a thinker. Like I just am am more someone who looks at my thoughts, and that makes a lot of sense to me. And so mm. I really love CPT. I'm a, a trainer in CPT. So I train a lot of mental health providers. And when I um, treat clients, you know, I offer them both options, but pr predominantly end up seeing um, uh, implementing CPT. Yeah. Okay. And, and what guidance, I know, so we're going to jump into, but what guidance would you give people in if they're thinking about getting treatment about which avenue uh, to go down? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, one of the things we're going to have as a resource is the National Center for PTSD has a clinical decision um, aid tool where you can ask yourself some questions. I think there's a couple of things that are important as one is what's available in your community. And so it's being a really good informed consumer of seeing who in your community specializes in trauma. What are they trained in? And so I have this dream um, in the some of the work that I do is that every client has all three options, um, but that may not be the case. The good news is, is that um, all three work. Um, the, the second thing is, is that, you know, thinking about what are the different components of the therapy and how does that fit with what your preference is? So CPT is more of a top-down thinking therapy, and it doesn't require someone to go into great detail about their trauma. And so that might be attractive to some people, but it does require some writing. All th uh, CPT and PE require some practice assignments, so out-of-session practice. And I think EMDR does too a little bit. PE is more of a bottom-up. So some people think to themselves, I'm a doer. I like to do things. I don't like to think about things. I don't want to do any of that writing. And so it's more of a behavioral treatment. And so some people are drawn to that, that that makes more sense to them. Um, uh, and so an EMDR, um, I, I think like that, that's just another therapy where you might say, hey, I don't want to do these things. Or, oh, I really like that. That seems to make more sense to me. And so I think it's about the good news is whatever decision you make, if you have the luxury of all three options, all three are good options. Oh, that's great. Okay. So actually let's do it now. CPT. What is cognitive yeah. processing therapy? Yeah. So cognitive processing <laughs> therapy was developed by Patricia Resick. She's now at Duke. Candace Monson, um, who's now at Ryerson up in Toronto and, and Kate Shard, who's at, uh, Cincinnati VA. Um, and it is a therapy that looks at the thoughts that somebody's having after their trauma. It's plus or minus 12 sessions. They're 50 minute sessions. So traditional psychotherapy, um, it uh, can be done individually. It could be done in a group setting. It can be done in a combination of both. It's typically done weekly, but there are more, there's more and more research where we're seeing therapy being done more frequently, um, as frequent as doing um, uh, 12 sessions in five days. Um, and what we know is, is it doesn't, what we're seeing is um, people get, get better. Um, and so when I think about myself and my life, if something were to happen and I develop PTSD, which could happen, I need to get better quicker. Um, and so I think that the timing of therapy is one of the things that's changing in the research where we're seeing, hey, we can see people multiple times a day. And people just get better quicker. Um, so that, that's something uh, for people to, to think about. Um, it has three phases of treatment in CPT. So first um, is an assessment. So you need to be assessed. Your therapist is going to take into account your trauma history, um, your current symptoms, your goals for treatment. And then part of that process is to identify which one or two of the traumas that you've experienced is really impacting you the most today. And we call that your index trauma. And so that's going to be the predominant focus on treatment. And usually there's one or two. So in my clinic, we've probably assessed, I don't know, upwards of 3000 service members. 
and they've had extensive trauma, but generally there's one or two that we can kind of zoom in on. And that'll be the predominant focus of treatment. And what we find is if we work on the, the, the trauma that's driving those symptoms, those nightmares, those intrusions, that the other traumas get better too. And we don't have to go through every single trauma, um, which is the good news. Um, so after we do an assessment and we get ready to start CPT, it's really about focusing on psychoeducation. So understanding more about what PTSD is, how it's developed, how it's maintained, um, understanding about the way we think about things in the world. So in CPT, we are coming from the place of that the way we think about things impacts the way we feel. So let's think about an example. When you are growing up, you are learning about the world in different ways. And so Jason, you were, you were mentioning your nephews. When your nephews were a little bitty and they just learned new words, what was a word that they would call everything? Good. Good. That. Yeah, everything was good, mm -hmm. even when it wasn't good. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes it's no, right? They just mm -hmm. learn this word no, and they're saying no to things they want. No, yep. no, no. And you take it away and they want it back. Or um, maybe kiddos have like a dog. And so they see like a cat for the first time and, and they go dog. doggy, right? And so one of the things that happens is we use words and labels and schemas to predict and control the world. And our brains go from simple to complex. And so over time, we learn that there's a difference between a chihuahua and a cat might be bigger than the chihuahua and a Great Dane that's black and white, but that's not a cow. That's still a dog, right? So we can kind of figure that out over time. One of the things that we're all taught, um, either directly or indirectly, is what's called the just world myth or belief. And it's cross-cultural. It's been studied in every culture. And it's this idea that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. And you and I know that that's not necessarily realistic, that yeah. good people do bad things and bad people Good things happen to bad people. If I speed, I may or may not get a ticket, right? But if you think about it as kiddos, I've got a five and six-year-old. I'm not going to tell them if you hit your brother, you may or may not get in trouble, right? Because I want to raise good citizens. And so, so we're given all these messages. And if you've ever thought to yourself, why me or why them? then that's kind of an example of the just world belief. Maybe as you learn some bad news about somebody you really care about, um, or uh, maybe something happened, you are know, like, why me? Um, and so we all sort of think about this sometimes, and we're generally able to be flexible and realize that, that this is not necessarily the way the world works and operate in the gray. But if we go back to trauma and PTSD, at the time of the trauma, people go into what is called fight, flight, freeze mode, and their brain gets stuck on that really simple thinking. And so they're trying to make sense of why this thing happened, because if I could just figure out why it happened, then I could predict and control and protect myself in the mm -hmm. future. And so after the trauma is over, people look back on it and they think to themselves, if only I should. So they're now looking back with different thinking, sometimes older thinking. So sometimes you're 40 years old looking back on that five-year-old thinking, I should have right, told someone, I should have done something different. Um, or, you know, our service member veterans, I should have taken a different route. You know, mm -hmm. if we would have taken a different route, it wouldn't have happened. I should have left him earlier, a domestic violence survivor, right? But there was some reason they did what they did at the time. And that reason was likely reasonable. And so part of what happens with CBT is we help to unpack that. Yeah. And I think it's that phrase, hindsight is always um, 20, 20. It's, it's always easy to look back and say what you should or shouldn't have done when you know what the outcome is going to be. For sure. Right. Yeah. And so when you have PTSD, you're stuck looking back in those nightmares and that re-experiencing. And so you try to avoid it, but also make sense of it. Um, mm -hmm. and so <laughs> when you're doing CPT, we're starting to kind of slow those thoughts down. We call those thoughts stuck points because they keep coming up hmm. and start to look at them one by one.
And so what does it look like when you start uh, trying to work on these thoughts? Because he's talked about assessment, he talked about psych psychoeducation, and then uh, the, what's the third, the third phase called? Yeah. So when we get started with CBT, we engage in a series of practice assignments to help to identify those thoughts or stuck points. Mm -hmm. And then clients are taught to challenge those stuck points. Um, and so we're first looking at the thoughts. We're teaching some, some skills to challenge them. We're going to focus first on those thoughts about trauma that if only it's my fault, I should, they should those types of thoughts mm -hmm. and help them to uh, access their, the clients are the experts on their experience. So it's helping them access their memory because they're stuck in that IMAX version, but not really accessing all of the context of the re it's likely they did everything that they could at the time. Um, and together we're going to explore that, right? There were some reason they made the decisions they did. And those reasons were likely reasonable. Um, and then the final phase of uh, we're going to start to move to their thoughts about themselves, others in the world, in the present and the future regarding safety, trust, power control, esteem and intimacy. OK, and um, so brief, I, I know that they're very, you know, face valid trust safety. But what, what, what do all those things mean individually? Yeah. So usually when someone experiences a trauma, they may have challenges in this area. So safety might be related to being able to protect myself, feeling safe in the world. Um, it might be about emotional safety. So maybe um, it's about getting close to other people. But oftentimes trauma survivors have developed a, a number of different um safety behaviors or maybe things that they do to feel safer. So we hear uh, people who've experienced sexual assault or um, childhood sexual abuse do weird things like sleep with the lights on or off or have a bunch of locks or sleep in the closet or sleep some, you know, do kind of weird things to feel safer. We hear among our combat veterans and active duty service members, things like not taking the same route when they're driving because uh, you could get ambushed. They may t like do perimeter checks to make sure that um, their, their house and their family is secure. They may be checking the locks throughout the night, hear something, and then they have to check all the locks and the windows. So they start to do things to feel safer that may be pretty intrusive on their life and limiting them in, that, in, a, in a way that's not that is not that helpful. Okay. And then uh, what would be some things that are more power and control? Yeah. So power and control for some people might be related to feeling feelings. So sometimes people have the thought, if I feel my feelings, I'm going to lose control. And so they're really, really stuffed down or numbed out. Um, and so we might need to work on thoughts related to that. Power and control could be related to perfectionism. So it might be if it's not perfect, it's wrong. Um, and so you might find your clients to be really, really perfectionistic, which might be a good thing because they do their practice assignment, but also could be a pretty bad thing because people who are really, really perfectionistic are never really celebrate any achievements. So as soon as they achieve something, they instantly raise the bar and they, they rob themselves from positive feelings. And that can really kind of leave people feeling pretty crappy, even though they're the high, really accomplished high achievers. Power and control might be related to being controlled by others. So it might be about authority. Um, and so depending on the client, depending on their experiences, depending on their culture and the way they grew up, each one of these modules is really personalized to the areas that are most impacted. Okay. And then I'm assuming esteem is self-esteem, how, how they feel about themselves, worth and self-concept. Yeah. And it's also other esteem. So it's about, mm. you know, how they feel about the world. So we often hear things like the world suck, people suck. Trauma survivors often have thoughts about if their trauma was perpetrated by an other group, it might be about men, right? Men suck for women who experience sexual assault, but it also might be about racial, ethnic, um, religious groups as, as their thoughts about that. Um, and, you know, I think that's really, really important to be talking about, to be asking about. Um, I, I've noticed in my clients um, uh, who are, um, 
racial or ethnic minorities that they often don't tell me that they're having these thoughts because they feel ashamed. They feel like they're racist. Um, and I think that, you know, if we don't work on these thoughts, um, it can definitely lead to racist behaviors and discriminatory behaviors because clients are having anxiety response that's trauma related when they're being presented with mm -hmm. um, this person that looks like the other that may have harmed me, but it's just a person. And then intimacy, in what ways um, might intimacy be impacted? Yeah, you know, it's, it, it's interesting because we see sexual intimacy concerns in trauma survivors of all types of trauma. So even among our combat veterans is we see sexual intimacy and closeness, but intimacy is more than sex. So it's about closeness. It's about friendships. Self-intimacy is about being able to soothe myself, knowing who I am in the world. Oftentimes trauma survivors have experienced trauma in their development and in, in early childhood or adolescence. And this might be a developmental area where they just don't know yet. They're just starting to kind of realize, hey, I like this. I don't like this. It's okay to have this opinion. I can tolerate stress. Um, and so that they're maybe starting the formulation of that. And CPT, we're going to kind of um, help them start to think about that and give themselves um the uh, authority and the uh, to 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 take control of that area for themselves. And uh, what sorts of tech? So, say that someone comes in for therapy, you're at this part of treatment, and and these are the different areas that people are uh, potentially having issue with. What type of techniques or skills would you teach them in order to help them with these? Yeah. So in CPT, what we're going to do is we're going to identify their thoughts. So their thoughts about the trauma, we're going to work on first. And so one thing that's different is maybe someone's been in therapy before and like, hey, I've talked about this over and over again, like a self-esteem issues or trust issues. Um, and it's not been so helpful. And the reason is, is because you haven't gone back to the beginning for the trauma. So first, we're going to work on the trauma stuck points that if only that I should, it's my fault. OK. And by working on that and looking at those thoughts and learning to challenge those thoughts, then we're able to better work on these areas. And so we're going to look at thoughts one by one. So maybe the thought is I'm damaged and we're going to look at the evidence for and against that. Right. We're going to look at we're going to ask questions like, is there anything about that stuck point that's uh, based on feelings or based on facts? Right. Is there um, is it a habit? So we're, we're going to use a series of worksheets to help help them kind of look at to evaluate what they've been telling themselves, because it's likely they've been saying something to themselves for a really long time. Um, and it may or may not be realistic. It may or may not be helpful. And do we know why the reason is that it's so important to work through the meaning of the trauma first and that allows people to be more open to change those other cognitions? It's almost like almost like an anchor that that holds everything down. Yeah, that's a really good question. So both in prolonged exposure research and cognitive processing research, what we've done is we've studied uh, cognition. So thoughts and symptoms and we, we have clients in research fill out questionnaires every single session. And by doing that, we're able to see, okay, what changes first? And in both of these therapies, what we've seen is, is that the thoughts start changing, the symptoms get better. So it's, the, it's by changing the thoughts, even in PE, when we're doing, we're, we're not we're doing, we're doing therapy, not, a, not as a thinking therapy, the thoughts start changing too, as you start doing new things. And so it's, it's really the thoughts that are driving the symptom change. Um, and so CBT is just directly intervening on those thoughts. Okay. And then, uh, when we, when people do uh, P or prolonged exposure, um, the reaction, and I think you said this before, the reaction to the trauma narrative or the story that they write uh, decreases over time and you said becomes mm -hmm. more black and white. Um, mm -hmm. Even if you don't, and we'll get to the narrative part of, of CPT, but even if you don't do any sort of narrative work or any sort of exposure work, when you work on these um, more cognitive ways of, of, of processing the trauma and going through all these different uh, issue domains, does that then also reduce how intensely someone reacts to memories and recounting of the traumatic event? Mm 
Yeah. So in CPT, um, what we see is by looking at the thoughts, the intrusion, so the nightmare starting to come down, the reactions start to come down. People are not avoiding as much. They're able to kind of move in their world in the way that they want to. So I often hear, you know, pre-COVID clients talking about, yeah, I went to my grandson's birthday party or, you know, just spontaneously start doing things and they're not having that anxiety response. They're actually enjoying themselves. Um, and so, so we, we start to see people living the life that they want to live. Mm. And, and in many ways, that's the, one of the most important things that we're looking for in treatment is people living the way that they want to live and feeling like yeah. they're being adaptive to the lifestyle that they want and following their values. I never have a client come in and say, Hey, I want 10 points less on that symptom measure that you care about. They don't care about that. Mm-hmm. That's just like maybe when my doctor takes my blood pressure, like I don't, I don't really understand those numbers that much, but I want to be able to live a healthy life is that the blood pressure helps my doctor determine kind of a treatment plan for my blood pressure. The, the symptom measures that we have clients take are like a vitals check, but it's really about living a better life. And usually that's about with their family, with their kiddos. It's about being able to to uh, do better at work or get the job that I want. It's about re-engaging in life in a personally meaningful way. And then what is the uh, narrative portion of the treatment? Mm -hmm. So in CPT, there are two different versions. One version includes what's called a trauma account, where you would write in great detail about the traumatic event. And you're supposed to write about the, your thoughts and feelings and your different senses. And you do that two times in, C, in CPT with the trauma account. And the purpose isn't exposure. It's actually to help you feel your feelings. So for clients, people can get stuck in their thoughts, but they can also get stuck in their feelings because they might tell themselves, if I feel my feelings, I'm going to lose control. And they might get really good at numbing out. Sometimes we minimize that as a skill. It's a skill to be able to push it all down. And as, as therapists, we see it in our office a lot. And clients sometimes don't, don't think about it as a skill, but it is. And so the purpose of that trauma account is to help clients feel their feelings. Um, we can also do CPT without a trauma account. So that's the great news um, is that we've had research studying the trauma account versus not the trauma account. And what we found is that Regardless of whether we do it, people get better and they stay better. Um, so it doesn't change your outcomes. Um, and the, when you don't do the trauma account, people get better quicker. Um, and so when we don't do the trauma account, people feel their feelings through a different way, through looking at their thoughts. And it's not that we never talk about the trauma, but we don't necessarily get into the, to the details. It's really not about what happened, but what they've been telling themselves about what happened. And so we kind of help people feel their feelings by looking at their thoughts about the trauma. So sometimes clients come into my office and they say, I'm not doing that. Okay, no problem. We don't have to do that trauma account. For some clients, it may be really important to them. I really need to kind of write it down. Um, and so there are options when you choose CPT about how you would do it. Just like you may have the option to do this individually or in a group setting. Um, and you said that people get better with the treatment without without that section in it. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any any uh, have they explored the mechanism behind that yet? Is it just because it's less sessions because you're not spending time on that or um, mm -hmm. I mean, because I'm thinking about the other way? What about doing it actually slows things down? Yeah, so it's um, it's not less sessions. So in the study that we, uh, it's called Dismantled, where we took apart the different pieces, um, it was still 12 sessions. So they approached it as 12 sessions. And what happened is, is that the trauma account, as people are writing about their trauma account and feeling those feelings, their symptoms stayed elevated for those two sessions. And then as soon as they were over with it, it came right back down. Without the trauma account, we just saw the symptoms start to come down quicker. Um, um, and so both are equally effective. We just see it, we just saw it differently. And, and I think the, the good news is, is that you have options. Um, and I think that the, the 
the mechanism or the way in which it works is by helping you feel your feelings. And you can feel your feelings about what happened, which are generally feelings like sadness um, without having to write about it. Um, so that's that's the good news. OK. And uh, looking and did they have a longitudinal piece to it, like looking like, you know, three months, a year down the road? Mm-hmm. What it and, and it, it came up as, as equivocal? Yeah. So good question. Yes. So research follows um, participant uh, people who've experienced who are part of research for three months, six months, one year. And actually, we do have um, a study where we followed um, women who were treated with both CPT and PE. We followed up with them five to 10 years later, and they stayed better. So unlike things like depression or substance abuse, where we see relapse, where people have multiple episodes of symptoms, we actually don't see that in PTSD. When people get treated, they stay better. Um, Now, life happens in a decade. So in that decade, you might have experienced more things in life, like maybe even another trauma. Um, uh, But we didn't see relapse in that way. Um, We saw people when they followed up with the the, the people, we saw that that some of them had gone on to get more therapy, Um, but they'd gone on to get therapy for things like couples issues, uh, grief, maybe they had a loss. And so I think one of the great things about when you have a positive therapy experience and something happens in your life that, that you need support with is that it makes you more willing to reach out to a therapist. Oh, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, mm-hmm. And do people develop more resilience to, to future trauma and um, when they go through one of these types of treatments? That's what, I mean, that's what we've seen. So that's what we saw in the study is that some of the the women, they were women in the study that experienced Mm -hmm. sexual assault, went on to have more trauma, but didn't develop PTSD. And so one of the things that my research group, it's just called the Strong Star Consortium, is in the process of doing, we've been treating active duty service members, many of which went on to deploy again, which would result in additional trauma exposure. And so we're, we're trying to understand that more in a combat environment. But but that's what we think, because we're teaching clients a set of skills that they are able to use in their life, whether it's for everyday stressors or traumatic events. And so the same set of skills that we would do in therapy, they could use when they experience another trauma. And it's not uncommon that when we when we followed up with our service members a year later, that they tell me like, oh, I was telling my buddy, you know, it, you're telling yourself it's your fault. Like, help me understand that. Did you mean? Did you intend that to happen? So they're sort of taking the skills and 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 sharing them with other people who are trying to make sense of trauma. Yeah, I saw a great talk um, where somebody was looking at their research on the dissemination of CBT and mm-hmm. how, you know, cognitive therapy, how it spreads out because you help one person and then that person um, might use those skills with other people or with parenting mm-hmm. and then they're happier and how it could keep escalating outward and outward from one person getting treated. And, and that's exactly what you're talking about. Helping one yeah. person can help many. Absolutely. Um, so if you were to say in a nutshell, what the mechanism of change is in this in, in CPT, what is the mechanism of change here that helps people live a happier life? Yeah. So I think with CPT and people who have PTSD is helping them to look at what they've been telling themselves about the trauma, that it's my fault. If I would have done something different, it wouldn't have happened. And helping them to discover their truth right, of what actually happened. And it's likely that they did everything that they could at the time. By helping them to contextualize their trauma as it happened without trying to change it, the if only is the I shoulds, the hindsight, 2020, um, then part of what happens is they start to feel that natural feelings. Those natural feelings get unstuck too. And they start to grieve, right, that this was something that they couldn't have changed. Maybe it's it's actually grieving a, a, a traumatic loss, the loss of someone that they weren't able to feel when they were stuck in this guilt and shame and anger. Um, and by doing that, then they're able to better see some of the things they're telling themselves about themselves, others in the world in the present day and recalibrate that because it may not be that realistic or helpful. And we start seeing people start living the life that they want to live. So doing things that are important to them, like, 
in Texas going to their kiddos football game, you know, things that are that are really important to them that they start to, to do. And they don't have that anxiety response because they are not having the thought about this being dangerous hmm. um, because it's not. Um, just going to a, a, a kiddo's football game, it may, it may be loud, it may be a little chaotic, but it isn't typically a place that we would say is dangerous. And I think one thing people notice that they listen to several of the podcasts is just this idea of experiential approach rather than avoidance, emotional approach rather than avoidance being such a huge switch um, mm-hmm. to, to being to living a, a happier, less stress-free and less anxi- anxious and depressed life. Um, For sure. Yeah. And of course, everybody has a certain level of anxiety, certain level of depression, and that's helping adapt, healthy and Mm -hmm. adaptive. uh, But that avoidance really gets in the way often and can make things worse, um, oftentimes makes things worse and better. Yeah, it does. You know, and it's 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 about kind of living the life that you want to live. Right. And and um, when I work with clients and nobody's I've yet to meet somebody who says, yay, a long line. I love lines. Right. But can I tolerate it if I need to do that? And I want when I lived in Southern California, going to Disneyland or Knott's Ferry Farm was really important. And often veterans get to go for free. So their kiddos want to go. Can I tolerate it? Can I can I be okay in this so I can do the things that are important for me and my family? Um, But we don't have to love it. Okay, so if people um, want to be able to uh, follow you or check in on the work that you're doing, where could they find more information? Yeah. So my research group is called the Strong Star Consortium. So that's strongstar.org. I also am the program director of a a program called the Strong Star Training Initiative. So strongstartraining.org. And what we do is we train community providers and evidence-based treatments for PTSD, including CPT and prolonged exposure. Um, we're grant funded. Um, and so I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. So that, that's my university affiliation. Um, and y- you mentioned two different Strong Start websites uh, there. W- w- what's the difference between the two of them? Yeah. So Strong Star uh, Research Consortium or strongstar.org is our research group. And we conduct um, clinical trials and research studies to understand uh, and help treat, assess, and prevent combat-related PTSD. Mm -hmm. And so over the last decade, we have um, probably completed more than 25 different studies to really advance the area of combat PTSD among active duty service members and post-9-11 veterans. Um, and so that, that's a research area. So if you are wanting to know what are people studying now, um, because it takes a while from a research study getting funded to those results being revealed and, and, and learning from that. You can learn about all the different research that is happening right now for combat PTSD by our group at strongstar.org. I identify as a clinician. I just happen to work in research um, and I really have been focused more on how do we get the information from research out to clinicians and community settings and also out to consumers, so clients. And so I'm from a small town in Illinois and many of my my, um, classmates joined the military um, after graduation. And so also there's a, just in any small town, in any town, there's a high exposure of trauma, whether it's childhood or sexual assault or accidents. If somebody I cared about in my small town developed PTSD, I'm not sure if there's a provider there that's trained in these, these therapies. And so we started the Strong Star Training Initiative in 2017 through some grant funding really to train community providers. The VA has a training program for their workforce and the DOD has one for their workforce. But if you're a community provider, that's not a VA provider or a DOD provider. There wasn't a lot of doors you could knock on to get access to evidence-based training, 
training. And so that's, that's the Strong Start Training Initiative is really uh, focused on training community providers and evidence-based treatments for PTSD and providing ongoing support through consultation as they're, in, as they're learning and implementing that with their clients. Mm-hmm. And outside of Strong Star, where might people be able to find, uh, you know, say that you're not a veteran, like where could other people mm-hmm. find cognitive processing therapy? Yeah. So um, Dr. Resick, Shard, and Monson have a website called CPT for PTSD. That's really the, the, the hub of all of the CPT resources. They've got a roster. They've got information on trainings that are happening uh, across the globe. Um, they've got articles that you can get access to. There's, there's a video uh, that describes CPT. It's a great website. And then I think you also had mentioned earlier, I think you said the National Center for PTSD was that clinical decision tool to see um, if maybe you should look into treatment or what type of treatment would would be well suited for you. So the National Center for PTSD has so many great resources and information. They've got an about face campaign, which really hear you hear about people, veterans with PTSD, their experiences with treatment um, and PTSD. And so they also have uh, whiteboard videos that describe like what is evidence-based treatment? You know, sometimes we use terms that just don't make a lot of sense. And so they, they've got whiteboard videos that helps you understand what are what is evidence-based treatment. They've got a whiteboard video on CPT. They've got a whiteboard video on medications to just really help understand um, whether you're a consumer or a provider, um, what's out there and what 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 should I know about that? And a clinical decision-making tool that you can kind of go through with your therapist, you can go through on your own to think about what's the best match for me on treatment. The last thing I want to mention is I think the best is that um, there is an NPR uh, story uh, that was done um, called 10 Sessions. Um, And Dr. Deborah Kaysen, who at the time was at University of Washington, now she's at Stanford, and an NPR reporter who had experienced trauma and developed PTSD, they embarked on a report, this 10 sessions, where uh, the reporter um, audio taped her therapy sessions. And so in this two part, it's a two hour NPR story. What you're going to hear is Deborah Kaysen, Dr. Kaysen doing CPT with this reporter um, over 10 sessions in two weeks. And you're going to hear what the therapy is. So sometimes therapy is like this black box that happens behind these closed doors. Like you're in the therapy room with them and you get to hear the CPT sessions and what they're doing. You also get to hear what the clients, this reporter's experience was, you know, outside of session, you know, what she was really thinking and feeling, how she liked it and didn't like it how it changed her in different ways. And over the course of those two weeks, you really get to hear recovery uh, for this reporter. It's one of the most important contributions, I think, to uh, the mental health field um, in that therapy doesn't have to be so scary. Um, and, and, and by this reporter's um, just... Uh, bravery to share her personal story and intimate details. I think um, she has really helped so many people. I think in the first week there were 3 million downloads. Um, So keep downloading. Yeah. And and that's absolutely amazing. Definitely going to put that in the, in the show notes. Um, But how often do you get to see an actual course of treatment to know, you know, what it looks like to actually get a certain treatment. Um, I don't Never. know another one that's like this besides that. So that that's, that's definitely no. a must listen. Sometimes we see it in TV and movies and oftentimes mental health providers just kind of go, Oh, that's not real. That's Absolutely. not helpful. Mm-hmm. All right. So any final thoughts or comments about um, CPT or PTSD or any of the work that you're doing? Yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you for this opportunity to share, uh, to share more. Um, I think one of the things that's really important is PTSD is treatable. Um, So when we look at the research among our civilian 
folks, um, we see about 80 to 90 percent remission rate. So no longer meeting criteria for PTSD. We see a little bit less. uh, So somewhere between 40 and 60 in our veterans and active duty service members, but no other problem area in our mental health diagnosis do we see this robust of a response to psychotherapy. And so, you know, I really hope that people feel hopeful that if they're someone who is treating trauma or they're someone who's experienced trauma and has PTSD, that recovery is possible. Mm. Yep. Yeah, for, for people that, are, that have gone through trauma or have PTSD, there are treatments that work. Um, yeah. And I think that you did a beautiful job um, telling them the different things that they could do and particularly the cognitive processing therapy. So um, hopefully a few, a few people will, will, or more than a few people will go out and look for these things. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for the opportunity. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming on.